Hi everyone, I'm Anad of Astrolab Diagnostics and I'm very excited to welcome you to the second episode of Single Soulmates. In this series, I will interview influential and interesting figures in the world of immune monitoring. The goal is to learn about their background in the field and hear their thoughts about current and future challenges. Today we are joined by Dr. Michael Leopold, the Site of Manager at the Stanford Human Immune Monitoring Center for the past decade and the manager of Cytoforum for the past six years. Uh, Mike is a mass cytometry veteran who uh, first encountered the CITOF at the University of Toronto in 2007 before DVS Sciences even existed. And uh, Mike, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank, you, thank you for inviting me. And um, I think many of our viewers will be surprised to hear that you have no flow cytometry experience or any formal immunology, immunology training. In fact, you were trained as an in vitro biochemist. Um, how has that background benefited your work with mass cytometry? Um, I think it helps um, with the thinking about the chemistry involved, um, both with the conjugation chemistry and buffers and that sort of thing. But we also have, but also about the metals that we use, the ionization in the plasma, um, the metals um, and chelators, you know, the fact that there's now an MCP9 polymer um, um, for the cadmiums from fluidime that um, obviously the cadmiums being plus two can't easily go into the same X8 max bar polymer um, because of size and charge issues. Um, the other thing is that at least my undergraduate chemistry and my chemistry training, there was a lot of instrumentation that um, I had to learn that I had direct hands-on experience with and including tearing machines apart um, as necessary. And so um, to be sort of in charge of an instrument, you have to not be scared of tearing it apart. Um, hopefully you can get it put, put it back together. Um, so I think that's good. Um, and then sort of a lemon, um, making lemonade from lemons. If I don't have any experience in flow, I don't have anything bad to unlearn, <laughs> um, which is definitely a, an issue we've had with some people. And actually, along these lines, do you have any recommendations for flow cytometrists or flow cytometry users who are entering the world of mass cytometry? What do they need to unlearn? Um, I mean, one of the first things is having to think a lot more about panel developments. Um, I, think, I think now with the spectral flow, um, with having much larger panels and that sort of thing, I think there is, a better, I think a lot of flow people are having to, having to go back and reevaluate their panels. Um, but there are a lot of poorly designed panels in flow, just like there are a lot of poorly designed panels in Cytoff. Um, and I think that that is something that really needs to be reconsidered. I've had a lot of issues with people wanting to, throw a bunch of things into, into dump channels that may not be wise in their experiment because they're used to having to think about, oh, I only have eight channels that I can work with. Mm -hmm. You don't have that issue in Cytoff. Um, the other thing is that I think that there's also a big issue about people are used to making having to make sure that their floor floors don't bleach well that's you can't bleach a metal ion so that's not really an issue but mm -hmm. Cytop has other issues that you have to track down um metal contamination and buffers is a big one um you know the number of times that we've run samples that are just chock full of iodine from um from FICOL or barium from you know a gibco buffer that was perfectly fine for flow that is not perfectly fine for uh, for Cytoff. The number of times I've had the argument with someone about their PFA, um, you know, why did my cells bust? Um, you know, my PFA was, was fine for flow. Well, you ran your flow samples in PBS. You're running your Cytoff samples in milliq or perhaps now CAS, but the osmotic pressure is different. Um, thinking a lot more about their components. Um, as a chemist, I was taught to basically build everything from scratch, mm -hmm. that you should know every component that's in every single one of your buffers. Um, chemistry is still a lot less kit driven than a lot of biology and a lot of immunology. 
And that's something that occasionally also comes back to cause problems, either with the chemistry involved, um, or at the very least, how can I tell if it's affecting my experiments? Mm -hmm. Tracking lot numbers and that sort of thing, people should be from all sorts of science should be doing it. But I think that that's something that is particularly important the more components that you have. Yeah, and um, I think it connects really well to what you said about your background in biochemistry. And uh, you mentioned barium. I think there's an ongoing discussion inside the forum right now about yes. some sort of barium contamination. Yes, and, it, and how to detect it um, in your samples so that you're not wasting your time running sample, or standing samples that you can't even run um, mm -hmm. because they'll blow the top off the instrument. Um, that's an ongoing issue. It's not just for barium, although barium is one of the more common ones. What do you mean when you say blow the top off the instrument? Um, so, where, so barium-138, I believe, is something like 85% of natural abundance um, barium. Mm -hmm. So the, basically, you generally only see the, the 138 track. If you can see the other four or five isotopes as tracks, then your barium signal is way too high, and you can actually be causing damage to your um, Cytops detector. Or, or to, the max, to the mass spectrometer itself? Um, basically, you're shortening the lifetime of the detector. OK. That's good to know. Um, and whenever one of these threads come up, I'm, I'm waiting to your re reply. Because mm -hmm. I know, that, I mean, my understanding of the Cytop is very shallow. As a bioinformatician, I think about the numbers and I think about the markers, but I know very little about the chemistry. So whenever one of these questions come up, I'm really curious to see what you're going to answer. Well, for, for informat informaticians, one of the reasons that Lars Olson and I wrote that um, cytometry A review that came out about this time last year was that he was an informatician that was visiting our lab, and he and I had several discussions that were started out as 20-minute discussions and became two-hour discussions, talking about all of the different components on the bench side as well as on the machine side. And so something like something as simple as oxide spillovers or the fact that you could have a contamination that you, that is not present in your data because you're not acquiring the, that channel, but maybe the oxide channel that you're, um, is in um, the panel that you're acquiring. So basically, you're having this background that is seemingly out of nowhere, but that's because of some other problem that you have actually in your sample. And actually, when you mentioned this, I think this is one thing that people who come from flow to the world of the Cytoff, they think that there is no spillover. And, and <laughs> go and, ahead. And there is. And that's something that was underappreciated um, at the beginning of Cytoff. I mean, mm -hmm. if you go back to the very, very, very early pre DVS Sciences papers from um, Scott Tanner's group. Um, when they were at, at University of Toronto, that when they were publishing in mass spec journals, they were actually very clear about this. Oh, really? I wasn't yeah. aware of that. Yeah. So if you go back to you know one of the JA, JAAS articles, there's actually a spillover table that they have. Um, but it's something that was sort of pushed to the wayside slash de-emphasized in the marketing, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's. And I think that that's something that is much better appreciated, especially after things like Bill O'Gorman's um, spillover paper. Um, I think that people are, Cytop has been around for almost 10 years now, or about 10 years now. I think that there's, I think we're in a process of reevaluation. Um, and I think that that's really good for the field. Yeah, I agree. And I think you, I think you, you, meant, you, you said it well, where, there was some knowledge that was lost in the transition from the prototype to DVS and from DVS to fluidine. And there's a very re-evaluation, maybe even a rediscovery of some of that information. Yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons why I've tried to make sure that even those early papers are, are, have been posted to Cytoforum's literature subforum mm -hmm. so that they at least are there so that if you are somewhat crazy and want to go back and read, 
um, you know, 800 papers about CITOF, all there. Yes, and CITOF Forum is an excellent resource. So a shout out to that, uh, which you've been creating amazingly well for the past six years. Thank you, it is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's amazing. Um, I think that, I'm guessing you are on vacation in December and I didn't get any notes about new papers. And then on January 5th or something, I suddenly got 20 emails and I'm like, yes, I'm so yeah. happy. Yes, yeah, just like I didn't post any when I was away in Berlin for the, uh, for the meeting a couple of weeks ago and then had to post about 10 when I came back. So thank you for that. I, I'm very, I was very excited to see that blast of papers at the beginning of the year. Thank you. Um, so switching gears for a minute, I think your core is the longest running FIFA service site off. Am I correct? As far as I know, Adib's is a close second. Um, right. but, but I think I think the HMC is still uh, was was the very first. I think so. So could you tell me a bit about your service model and what kind of projects do you support? So we are a service core rather than a um, standard flow core. Um, by that, we're almost like a small nonprofit company. Um, we perform mostly standard experiments for people. We do initial data analysis, which is mostly QC related, and then give them back their results in a bill. Um, so as I said, that initial analysis is mostly QC and is basically, in terms of the flow work, basically Flojo gating templates based on how we have qualified um, the, the panel and the experiments. We do not perform Citrus, Flowsome, that sort of thing um, for, for the customers. Excuse me? We don't have, we don't have the bandwidth. Um, is, is a large part of it. Um, we leave that for the that level of a of clustering and you know sort of analysis for the customer to do. Um, we also compared to a regular flow core like we have, um, we have a regular flow core that has a site off here at Stanford, which is the more traditional model of they supply the instrument and the people to maintain it, the people to train other people to to run their samples, but the individuals would run their samples. We generally don't train non-HIMC people, and we don't generally let HIMC people run on our instruments. Got it. And, um, and you put a lot of emphasis on, on the standardized nature of your service. I imagine that pretty often people show up and ask for an exception, or can you just do this tiny tweak? So what's your, what's your way of dealing with these kinds of requests? Um, very early on, um, when we were still sort of settling on the, the CITOF model of this. So the flow was a lot easier because our standard phenotyping panel was um, the HIPSI LIO panel. So I think there was room for like one drop in or something like that, but that was basically it. Um, there were a couple other assays that were still all liquid reagents, um, but CITOF was definitely something where uh, we tried to come up with a regular panel based on the Lyo, um, Lyo plate panel. And then people started wanting all these modifications. We tried doing it for a while and it just was not maintainable, mm -hmm. um, which is another reason we don't maintain an antibody bank. Um, so, you know, we maintain our stocks for our regular panels. Um, but it just became cost prohibitive, both in time and materials. If we have a very large project, I don't know, let's say 100 samples or more come in, then we may start talking about um, panel modifications. But in general, uh, nowadays about all that we do for our standard um, service core work is if there is a fluidime antibody that they want, we do sort of a one for one swap out um, and then somewhat say is buyer beware, um, you know, that we have not qualified that fluidime antibody in that panel. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to make sure we try to do a sort of a quick overview to make sure that we're not hitting any of the obvious spills. Um, so like in my regular panel, there are a couple slots that are open. Um, because of spillovers from a T cell marker and a B cell marker. And so we, in those adjacent channels, we can't put a T or a B marker there. Mm -hmm. um, we could maybe put a monocyte marker there. And so that's something, you know, that we can play around with. But for the most part, 
um, we leave a certain amount of buyer beware on that. Yeah, and um, looking at my end of things, Astrolab is a standardized service and um, people want to customize it and we do it to the best of our ability. But then there's the, um, there's the, the challenge of explaining to the, to the customer that if you customize, it's not standardized anymore. Yeah. And you, we don't know what's going to be the effect. Yes, you add, a cha you, you add the marker on channel 164, but it might affect other channels as well. And we can't be like, uh, responsible for that. Yes. I mean, from, from your point of view with a standardized analysis pipeline, your caveat would be assuming that you have done the panel on the correct panel optimization and the correct experimental validation and that you have satisfied yourself that you have quality data, only then can a pipeline really come in. That's correct. If you haven't done that, then there, then the best pipeline in the world is not going to save your data. Right. And another thing we face often is that um, a researcher wants to customize the labeling hierarchy to a specific subset, yeah. and they included the markers for that subset in their panel. So it's easy for us to tweak the software and tell Astrolabe, look for these cells. But then the, the platform doesn't find the cells and the researcher asks us where they are. And I'm like, well, you know, I've done manual gating and I can't see these cells anyway, either. Yeah. So have you validated this? And they're like, no, we just use the default titrations from Fluidime. I'm like, uh, yeah, it's not gonna work. Uh, no, and, and that's something in general, we've had pretty good success um, with Fluidime antibodies and we use them regularly in several of our panels. That said, in a, I would say at least 75% of the cases, we find that the titer that we use for our assay is not the one microliter per test recommended by Fluidime. Yeah, and I mean, it's biology, so it's not surprising. Well, and, and that one microliter per test from Fluidime may be in a slightly different protocol. So that's something that you can't just take someone's panel and they're, tight, and they're tighter mm -hmm. and immediately drop it into your slightly different assay. And assay validation is something that I think is definitely underappreciated in general in science, in Cytoff in specific. And it's, it's better to spend three months or more building a rock solid panel with a rock solid you know, experimental protocol behind it. Mm -hmm. Because once you've done that, then you can trust all of your data going forward. There's very little, there's very little question months or years later when you're done running your samples and you're trying to analyze your data, was this plate good? Is this a real signal? If you've done all of that work ahead, you can trust it. You've taken care of that already. Mm -hmm. And ideally you've instituted QC samples and that sort of thing to make sure that um, you can catch if there's an issue on a given plate so that you can adjust it or remove those samples. And that's something that I've, I think I have been very vocal about um, QC samples. And I think that some people argue it's you know, additional cost and time, and it is, but balance that, balance being able to analyze and QC your data versus not being able to analyze and QC data and you, and you can't wind up publishing that data set. Um, in fact, it's funny you say this because I, I had an email correspondence with a customer following the very cell. So we had a webinar about very cells. It's a new product from Biolegend. And we had an interview with uh, Sophie Van Gessen about reference spikings. Yeah. And following these, I had, a, I had an email correspondence with a customer where I suggested they include very cells in their experiment. And their reply was, we only need these if anything goes wrong. <laughs> you have to assume that something will go wrong and you have to put barriers or measurements in place so that you can catch when it goes wrong. Whether it's the instrument, whether it's a reagent goes bad or whether it's like it's happened to me, you have 40 antibodies that you're putting into a cocktail and you accidentally leave one of them out. 
if you have the QC sample in there, you can catch what is a mic problem from what is a sample, a, a customer sample related issue. And that's one of the reasons why we run um, a QC control with every service um, center sample that we run. And we include that free of charge. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that's rolled into the price. Well, I, I guess maybe I shouldn't say free of charge. It's at no additional cost. So, um, you know, if you bring us 10 samples, we'll run those 10 plus our um, QC control and you would not be charged for that 11th sample. That's really good to hear. And, um, and funny you should say that because with Astrolabe, we were facing the problem of how to price the reference spike ends. And after talking to customers, we just decided to not charge for them at all. So if someone has 100 samples and 100 reference spike ends, we're not going to charge for the reference spike ends because we want people to use them. Yeah. And if you charge even a cent, then they're like, ah, we don't need the controls. We're fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I was really happy to like happy to hear that you were saying it's a mic problem because I think we can you can probably argue that you are one of the most experienced people in the in the world with this. And if you're admitting that things go wrong, then things things completely go wrong. I and I've spoke I've talked in Berlin a couple of weeks ago, and I talked at the uh, at the Fluidime user meeting in Vancouver last um, last summer. I explicitly mentioned a case where I left out CD11C from my panel. I just got distracted. Someone came, came, came to talk to me when I was making up the cocktail and I just left it out. And that meant that for that plate or for that set of samples, we couldn't gate on the MDCs. Um, and so we wound up deciding to actually rerun all of those samples. Oh, wow. So we basically threw out that plate um, and um, reran at least one of the donors um, from that plate. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way that things are go. And, you know, with lyophilized cocktails or just frozen cocktails that a lot of people, including us, are now using um, after Axel's paper, um, I think that a lot of that will start going away. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's, you know, you could argue, oh, I'll just, you know, make my cocktail with, you know, with robotics. Well, you can still have a reagent go bad. You can have, a, oh, yeah. you know, your robot's pipette tip get clogged um, or something like that. You have, you still have, once you've validated a frozen cocktail or a lyophilized cocktail, then you're, you should be pretty safe. But, you, you know, it's one thing to use something like that for a couple months. It's something else to use it for a couple of years. And also you're going to use it in contexts that are different from the initial testing. So, yeah, so things could change in unexpected ways, which goes back to the idea of just include the reference control. Yes. So um, I want to talk about publishing for a few minutes. And okay. historically, very few flow cytometry manuscripts included the FCS data. And I was actually going through this over the past week. I was looking for some flow data for an Astrolabe demo, and I really couldn't find much. And the best quality data was ended up being CyTOF. And um, you're, you're a vocal advocate of chaining the status quo around that and encouraging data sharing, especially with the CyTOF. Could you elaborate on your reasoning and motivation for data sharing? Um, number one, um, I think we've all read papers that have surprised us. <laughs> um, <laughs> Or where we feel that the authors have overinterpreted their data. Okay. <laughs> uh, and if, you can, if you can look at the raw data, you can convince yourself um, one way or the other. Um, otherwise, it's almost impossible to redo their analysis, um, mm -hmm. especially with long, complex pipelines. Um, if you have the raw data files, you can, um, even if you don't have their scripts, you can at least do some manual gating or something like that and convince yourself. The other thing is that I've shown, I believe it was last, about this time last year, um, that a lot of the, the algorithm developers um, for Cytoff data are reusing the same four or five data sets over yes. and over and over again. Um, I, when I looked at this, um, 
five data sets accounted for more than half of the reuse. Um, and I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying that that's limiting. Um, even in the last month, um, the Samizic and Levine data sets from 2015 were reused, but the Helios wasn't even out when, out when those were published. Yeah. Um, the Bendel 2011 science paper, great data set, but that's Cytop 1. Um, and EQBs didn't even exist at that point. Um, we know that the spillovers, dynamic ranges, sensitivity, optima, all of that sort of thing are not the same between the models of the instrument. And the TRECO 2015 paper in, in particular um, was the impetus for people like me and several other core managers to go back and reevaluate re our instruments. I don't have hard numbers on this, but my gut feeling is that some, at least some of the issues that people are having with different algorithms have to do with the fact that they were deliberately or not almost purpose built for certain data sets. And that if you take an algorithm that was built for a very detailed, highly specific analysis on, I don't know, phospho data, mm -hmm. it may not where, like one of the things about phospho is that in general, cell types respond similarly to a, a certain um, stimulus. So, you know, like if, if your CD4s respond, all of the CD4s shift mm -hmm. to at least a very good first approximation. That's not, the, that's not the case for stimulations with ICS assays, where only a certain number of your T cells might even make interferon gamma, let alone IL-2. And I'm not fully convinced that you can just take something that was purpose-built for Cytoff and put it in and immediately drop in an ICS at, um, data set. Oh, no. And Wait, is anyone doing that, that? I think that that's something that's underappreciated. Um, and I think that I would like to see more people being like Sophie Van Gassen and a couple other people that in their papers, they generally talk about where their, where their algorithms work and just as importantly, where they do not work. Mm -hmm. I don't think that every algorithm needs to work on every data set. But I think that the developers need to do a better job of actively trying to break their own algorithms to find out where they work and where they do not work. And I consider that to be part of the development. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, going back to my Disney paper from a few years ago, there is a whole supplement with different benchmarks and uh, different scenarios where we did manage to break the algorithm. But Unfortunately, it ended up in the supplement, so many people don't see it. And well, and and that's supplemental material is a whole other. <laughs> um, but um, at least you can say somewhere in the experimental that is part of the main paper. You know something about you know these this algorithm works well on this type of data, but. Um, may have performance issues on these other types of data, see supplementary middle figure seven or something like that. Like mm -hmm. you can at least drop a sentence or two in it and then, and then direct it to the you know, 15 pages of supplemental material that you've gone through or your GitHub site or, or whatever, um, wherever you've decided to put that. But I actually have more trust in an algorithm where the developer him or herself has said, it works on this. It doesn't work so well on this mm -hmm. because I feel like they have, like they actually understand the entirety of their algorithm. Yeah, that's a great point. And I wonder how much of this is a chicken and egg problem where someone is developing an algorithm and she or he runs the algorithm on the five data sets, the five data set, data sets. Yeah. Um, and they're showing results for the five side of data sets, which are, to be honest, not very representative of the kind of side of work people even do. Um, 
if I recall correctly, Levine's uh, work is either AML or bone marrow? I think it's AML. Yeah, it's AML. And um, the couple of other set of data sets like Mosman um, or, or Sean Bendel's 2011 paper, that was bone marrow. Yeah. Uh, so it's not even representative of the, um, of the common use case, which I would argue is PBMC and, and immune monitoring. And it's not representative of tissues, mouse data, uh, different panels and so on. Yeah. Um, I think some of it comes down to the issue of most of these algorithms are still coming out of academia for better yeah. or for worse. And grad students have to publish. Um, and so they'll have a grad student or a postdoc that writes a great new algorithm for either their or their lab mates data set. And then the grad student or postdoc leaves. And this is actually something that was brought up by um, Tyler Burns and Thomas Holt um, at the Berlin Mass Cytometry meeting is that this idea of software being its own project and being its own research and the idea that more than one person in a lab is going to be working on something and maintaining something. Um, I think Tyler gave the example from RNA-seq where he said that there's an entire lab that's built around the maintenance and bug fixing and improvement of the Surat algorithm yes. for single cell RNA seq. Ideally, something like that would start with cytometry analysis as well. I understand that there's a, a lot of funding issues around this. It can be hard to pitch that to funding agencies, let alone maintaining software engineers um, in academia at academic salaries. This is particularly a big issue in, in the Bay Area um, mm -hmm. with all the big tech firms here, postdocs and even staff scientists regularly leave for industry because you know they can get 50 to 200% um, salary increase. Um, but I think that it's, a, I think it's something that academia really needs to be thinking about more because it's, it's also just incredibly frustrating when you find a package useful and then after a year or two, all of the R package updates for the dependencies wind up breaking the algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I, I think that that's a basic problem. Um, you know, even something that's relatively widely used like Cytoff kits, um, about a year ago, Bioconductor took it off. Um, because it wasn't sort of being actively maintained and, and updated. And there is a, um, a Cytoff Kit 2 that you can find, um, but as far as I can tell, that that's um, still in a development phase rather than a public release phase. Yeah, it's still on GitHub, but not on Bioconductor. Yeah, so, and that's something that a lot of, like a very large number of people use. Mm -hmm. And it's, sort of being maintained, but I don't know that it's being actively maintained. Um, certainly not in the way that, you know, a, a commercial package would be. Yeah, and I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head where you said that it's an academic lab and they're guided by, by funding and by how to get the next grant. And unfortunately, maintaining software is not that. Um, there's actually an initiative from either from the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative or from one of these similar uh, funds where they're gonna fund open source projects. And the grant application is, we have an open source project and here's the plan on how to maintain it for th the next three years, give us money. And I think that that's fantastic. Yeah. So I hope we can see more of these from more official, let's say government funding sources, because yeah. I think that would encourage researchers to take that path. I, I definitely think that that's important. I mean, there have been more than 100 algorithms that have been applied to Cytop data. Mm -hmm. I would say there's probably only six, maybe, that are still actively being used. Um, so there are a lot of one-offs. Yeah. and. I mean, I, I'm doing my best to stay up to date, but 
something that was released three years ago and no one is using right now is going to be lost. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, I think today, so you mentioned side of kit, which comes up on side of forum every once in a while. Someone is saying side of kit is broken. Yeah. And uh, I think today at like 5 a.m. you posted a message about Biosurf. Yeah. Biosurf broken down. So yeah, um, basically something went on in the background. Um, Lars is fixing it. Um, I just got an email from him saying that it should be back up next week. Yeah. So. So thankfully, there's something, someone there yeah. who is looking into it. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to conclude with a discussion of the future of mass cytometry. And um, I'm putting it in these very ominous terms because it is a term I'm hearing very often lately. Um, there are several high complexity flow cytometers coming out uh, and exist already in the market. Like the BD Symphony is out there, the Static Aurora is out there, Sony is going to release their ID soon. And, um, and researchers come to me and say, well, now we can get high dimensional data with flow. Why do we need the CITAF anymore? So in your opinion, what is the role of the CITAF in a world where flow cytometry has similar capabilities with regards to channel count? I mean, this is definitely something that's coming up. I think there were at least three posters at, um, Cyto 2019 about this, and it's also something that I was asked about um, at uh, the, the Berlin meeting. Cyto still has an advantage in the number of channels, um, mm -hmm. especially with the release of the cadmium labeling kits. Um, you can now pretty easily get up to at least 50, um, whereas at least the at least the highest plex flow panel I've seen for an Aurora um, is 38 to 40. Um, yes. So I think that Cytoff is still ahead. Um, you know, as chemists make more fluorophores, um, there will, will probably be um, you know, an, an increase in that. Um, but at least for the time being, Cytoff is still ahead. Um, so I still think that Cytoff is best served as a discovery tool. We can put more things in, uh, you know, put more markers in. It's slower, it's destructive. So build your as large as you can Cytoff panel. Do a pilot, try and find something of interest. And then as Sean Bendel and some other people have shown, take your large Cytoff discovery panel, whittle it down to something that is more tractable by flow. Mm -hmm. And then, then run your hundreds or potentially, God forbid, thousands of flow samples, um, and get your throughput that way. It, it allows you to sort that sort of thing too. Use the machines in their best way, rather than arguing about which one is better. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm biased. Um, you know, as as someone very heavily invested in the in the Cytoff and with basically no flow background. Um, I think that, you know, of course I'm biased, um, but at the same time, I do think that the instruments have their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, and I don't, I don't understand from a researcher point of view, rather than a industry marketing point of view, arguing about which one is better. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm answering similar questions on which is better at Disney or UMAP. And like, just pick one and see what happens. And you can, I mean, just use the tool that you need. It doesn't matter which one is better in some abstract sense. Yes, because you and I have both read the paper saying that, oh, UMAP is better, or this implementation of Tisney is better. Or, I mean, at, at some point, just pick one and, and stay with it. Um, um, but yeah, to a certain extent, some of this quibbling about which one is markedly better. Like if, obviously if one works really well and one of them doesn't, you know, just like with a clustering algorithm, you still do see some people publishing with like dense VM or something like that. But, you know, on, on a PBMC data set, in my experience, dense VM will give you like 10 clusters. Well, I can manually gate more than 10 clusters. Um, 
out of a, out of a PBMC phenotyping panel. Therefore, I don't use it because I don't really believe the results. I, I, um, whereas arguing at a high level about which, which is better, Flosim or, or Phenograph, I personally use Flosim more because I don't really like downsampling. Um, but at the end of the day, for the same, you know, num for the same sampling level, they're both, they're both perfectly fine. And likewise, going back to the uh, spectral flow versus cytoff discussion, I imagine that for many use cases, they're, they're equivalent in many ways. And depending on the experiment, one might have an advantage over the other. A very common solution, like if your institution only has a cytoff and doesn't have, let's say, an aurora, then you should probably use the cytoff yeah. and vice versa. Um, but I like your perspective where the site of is a very powerful discovery tool and you can start from that and then go back to the flow. And that might even be recommended. Maybe you should aim to go back to the flow once you know more about the data. I mean, some of it comes down to what is your goal for a given project? Mm -hmm. Is your goal pure discovery? in which case you're probably going to be running maybe fewer samples, um, or is it going to be more bordering on the clinical diagnostics? If, you, if your goal is closer to clinical diagnostics, then you should be running flow because it's faster. And you, know, you can crank through hundreds or even thousands of samples a lot faster than you could ever do by, by Cytoff. Mm -hmm. But I, like I said, from number of markers alone, I think Cytoff still has the edge in, in pure discovery. Um, and therefore, that's probably where I would start. You know, if you have 500 samples, maybe take 50 of them, mm -hmm. do your Cytoff, or, or maybe even 100 of them, you know, do your Cytoff on a representative sampling of, this, of the samples that you have try and get a lead and then once you have your lead then go back to flow you know even you know even a 24 marker um, flow panel which is you know much more accessible um, nowadays than even four or five years ago you can get a lot of work out of 24 markers mm -hmm. you don't necessarily even have to use the highest end flow yeah that's a good point and using an analogy from Earlier this century, people use microarrays as a starting point and then go back to RT-PCR yeah. to validate. Well, I also think that, you know, in terms of, you know, the genomics or the, the, the sequencing technologies, Florian Mayer had the really interesting um, bioarchive paper um, six months ago or so, where they basically looked at doing a whole transcriptome versus a targeted what they called immunome, which was I think 500 genes, mm -hmm. rather than several tens of, you know, several thousand or several tens of thousands. Yes. And what they found was that at least for their study, the, the immunome was actually in some ways better because you had less false discovery that you had to account for because you were making fewer effective tests. And so that made, some of their discovery easier. And in, I would also just say, if you're studying immunology, yes, there, there may be metabolic stuff that's interesting, but I would say personally at a first pass, study the, study the immunology first. If, if you have an immunology project, study the immunology. And if you have other data from, you know, somalogic or something like that, um, that may be, saying, oh, the metabolome is interesting, or the um, uh, serum cytokine profile is interesting, then you may want to go back and you know, do, do some sort of follow-up. But I think, I think there's something, something to be said for casting your net widely, but I think, there, I think Florian's paper, to a certain extent, shows that you can cast it too wide and wind up missing some things. Yeah, and um, 
as I mentioned in the talk yesterday, the more the wider you throw your net, the more opportunity for multiple testing correction to mess up your yeah. p-values and false positives, as you pointed out. So I really like the approach of choose the uh, choose the resolution that you need based yeah. on the experiment. Yeah. Great. So I think this concludes uh, today. Anything else you want to add on your end? Um. The only other thing, getting back to the data yes. uh, release, um, I really do feel strongly about data release. Um, there definitely can be reasons um, for privacy issues. You know, a lot of European colleagues are struggling with the new GDPR law. Yes. Um, and the impact that it is having on their even ability to ship samples. Um, it, you know, the lawyers at their institutions are playing very conservatively with it, and it's causing some difficulties in some of their research. But, you know, it's the law. It needs to be taken into account. That being said, if you can publish your RNA-seq data set, I think there is no, absolutely no reason you cannot publish your Cytop data set. Mm -hmm. um, privacy would seem to apply to both. And... I showed again about a year ago that of the papers that do both assays, more than 50% of them only publish the RNA-seq because that's the only one that's required. And I, some people argue about, oh, you know, I'm not done analyzing the Cytop data. Well, you're probably not done analyzing the RNA-seq either. Uh, and you're still able to publish it or we're still being required to publish it. I think that especially if we're ever going to be moving toward a sort of discovery of different cell types in different diseases, like Antonio Cosma and Jonathan Irish in particular with his MEM algorithm, wanting to build giant databases of cell types that are found so that you can search them and say, maybe I'm studying disease A, but a lot is studying disease B, and we're finding a similar phenotype in our cases. Maybe they're related. We're never going to get there if the data isn't released. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a goal that we all need to be working toward. That's beautiful. And um, earlier in the conversation, you used um, algorithm development and, and uh, result validation as arguments for data sharing. And I think that what you said now is a much more powerful argument. Like, if we want to promote science, then we're going to need this. And I, I'm a big science nerd and science geek. I like science. I want to advance science. That's one of the reasons I work in an academic institution is that I do have that sort of blue sky. I want to, I want to push, push the boundaries of science. And I think data sharing nowadays is one of the, is one of the best ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And even something as simple as what does a healthy person look like? You know, there are more and more, papers that are coming out in the last couple of years of what does it, how does someone's immune profile change over time or over the decades? And with the flu studies that we've been doing at Stanford, some of that's starting to be answered now. And we're very slowly, unfortunately, putting the, the data up on import. Once all of that's up there, there will be more than, more than a thousand cytop phenotyping samples up. Mm -hmm that represents what, at least for the flu studies, which are, Cytop data was performed on pre-vaccination time points. So there are generally healthy controls of both genders, several age bands, most ethnicities. That alone, I think, will be a great data set. And you know, we're definitely getting papers from that. Um, you know, Shai Shinor um, in Israel is one of the main people analyzing that. And there was the um, clinical age definition um, paper that was published last summer. Right. Mm -hmm. We get asked all the time for data on healthy controls. You know, a researcher will come to us and say, well, I don't actually have a control for this. Do you have data that we can look at? Well, we're slowly publishing that. Mm -hmm. 
even just knowing what a general healthy person looks like, I think is a laudable goal, let alone how does unhealthy in the case of disease X or condition Y, what does that not healthy look like relative to healthy? Even if you will wind up having to recruit your own, for your study, recruit your own healthy controls, if there are data sets out there for you to look at and get a place to start, that will inform your experiments and potentially even inform your study design. That's good to know. And when do you think the, um, that data is going to be available on import? Um, I believe this January's release of imports um, covers um, the flu studies up through um, at least some of, of the 2015 flu year. Oh, wow. Um, and it's ongoing. Um, so I know that there are more data sets that have been generated and are in the process of being uploaded. Import, for some strange reason, only releases data quarterly. Mm -hmm. So hopefully over the next quarters of the year, more and more of the data sets will be released. Um, so, you know, stay tuned. Um, but, you know, even now, um, several of the, of the flu studies um, are, are already up there for, for, the, for the different flu years. I think now there are at least a few hundred samples. There's not a thousand, um, but there are at least a few hundred that are already up there. That's great. And it's also a strong argument for other people to publish their data. Yes. Like, this can be done. And it, it, it can be done. It should be done. Mm -hmm. I personally feel that it must be done. And I think that there's an enforcement issue in the funding agencies um, and an enforcement issue in the, at the level of journals um, that, in my opinion, it, they need to start cracking down on this because it's a little bit toothless to have the Gates Foundation saying that you must release all of the data that you generate under you know, this grant. And I know of at least three cases where that hasn't been released. Oh, really? Yeah. So there's no enforcement? There's very little enforcement. Mm -hmm. I think there's now a, a program officer focused specifically on data that is starting to crack the whip a little bit, but it's not just a Gates Foundation issue. Um, you know, the, the NIH says the same thing, and, you know, and yet look at how few data sets there are on import. Yeah, that's a great point. So, uh, so Mike, thanks again for today's interview. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, thanks for having me. And uh, it's, it's been interesting doing my first podcast. Yeah, hopefully we're going to have more of these in the future. Okay. And um, I would also like to thank our uh, editor, Heather Dwyer, and our designer, Mihai Kuman. Uh, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to our LinkedIn. We're going to have more of these episodes in the future. And please check out the Immune Monitoring Biweekly. It's a regular newsletter that we release with news in this field. Uh, you can find all the links in the video description. And uh, have a wonderful day. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.